Well, this year we have been uh, commemorating the uh, Protestant Reformation, which began 500 years ago, and uh, it seems appropriate this year to wish all of you a Martin Luther Christmas. That's the focus of my meditation this morning. And I say that because few people have found greater enjoyment in the celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ than Martin Luther. Uh, did you know, for example, that it was Luther's custom to give small gifts to his children and also to various workers in their household community during the Christmas season? It was not commonly the custom in those days, but it became the custom in Germany, uh, in part through Luther's own enthusiasm for Christmas. One of the students who uh, lived with the Luther family for a season commented that as Christmas approached, Luther grew increasingly cheerful, uh, something we should all aspire to. Uh, the student said, all his words and songs and thoughts concerned the incarnation of our Lord. Luther's theology touched his heart. He said, if it is true that the child is born of a virgin, then I must feel that there is nothing but laughter and joy in the heart of my father. Not surprisingly, Luther loved to sing Christmas carols and also to write some of his own, both the lyrics and the music. My favorite is a carol called From Heaven High, which takes about 15 stanzas to tell the entire Christmas story. It's a carol that Luther um, almost certainly first composed for his own children, then became common to sing in, with his congregation so that children of all ages would know the Christ of Christmas. Luther loved to preach about Christmas, not only on Christmas Day, but also in the days leading up to it. Here's a, a little sample from one of his Christmas sermons in 1519 in which Luther said that the story of Christ at Christmas actually gives us the righteousness and the virtue and salvation that it signifies because what we receive by believing this story is Jesus himself. On Christmas Day, Luther said, we can come to Bethlehem and find a tender maiden with a baby on her lap and say, mother, this baby is mine also. It's not surprising to hear Luther preach about Mary at Christmas because when he thought about how we should receive the Christ of Christmas, he often pointed to Mary's faith as an example for all believers. I know you remember the story. I've got my Bible open to Luke chapter 1 where part of that story is told. Mary, Mary's first Christmas really began with a greeting from the angel Gabriel. He was sent by God to a city of Galilee called Nazareth, to a particular virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And when this angel came to her, he said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. It's doubtful whether Gabriel could have found a more unlikely person to greet anywhere in Israel. Of all the, pe all the people that an angel can greet, it was Mary. Very young, probably only 12 or 13 at the time, in that what for some is awkward, I know it was for me, that awkward stage between childhood and adulthood. She was poor, a peasant girl living in a small country town. It was far from the courts of power. In fact, people had a kind of saying in those days, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Mary was also a female in a culture that in many ways discounted women, as so many cultures do. And yet here is Mary, given the greatest honor that any woman has ever been given, chosen to be the mother of Jesus, in a, in a way, if we understand the theology properly, the mother of God. And her material poverty, I think, was part of God's plan. Luther observed that God might well have gone to Jerusalem Picked out the daughter of the high priest who was fair, rich, clad in gold, embroidered raiment, attended by a retinue of maids in waiting, but God preferred the daughter of a plain man in a small town. I think it's because God had a plan of salvation that would require his son to humble himself and only then to be exalted. And what better way to show what Jesus had come to do than for him to be born to a woman like Mary from a town like Nazareth. And this is speaking to us of the grace of God, which is for all of us. 
All of us who in worldly terms may be in a lowly place, and yet the grace of God is for us through Jesus. Certainly God was giving this grace to Mary. This is what captivated Luther's attention, this person in a lowly place, but a recipient of grace. And this is the, the meaning of the angel's announcement. Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. The, the angel Gabriel pronouncing a blessing on Mary. God is with her to bless her, not because of her own merits, but because of his grace. That's the meaning of this term for favor coming from the Greek word for grace. As Luther looked at Gabriel's greeting, he gave this paraphrase, Oh, Mary, you are blessed. You have a gracious God. No woman has ever lived on earth to whom God has shown such grace. Truly, she is the blessed virgin who alone was called, called to give birth to the Son of God. And even though her experience is not our experience, nevertheless, her example is for us. Because in the same way that she received grace from God, this shows that God has grace for us, even if we may feel small, insignificant, overlooked by the world, forgotten in our troubles. We can know that God is with us to save us. Now, obviously, at least obviously to us, what Gabriel said to Mary was meant to be reassuring, and yet Mary was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. I think Mary probably would have done well at a liberal arts college. She was the kind of person who wanted to know the whys of things. What, what is this? Why is this? Why is it? What is the point of this? What has this person come to say? She wanted to get inside the details of the greeting. And Gabriel didn't leave her in suspense. He followed the greeting with an announcement. Don't be afraid, Mary. Luke chapter 1 at verse 30, you have found favor with God. This idea of favor is repeated. And he says, behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. And with these simple words, these clear phrases, the angel was announcing the greatest event in human history, the coming of the Son of God and the Savior of the world. And Mary believed it. She believed the prophecy of Gabriel, but she still had a question. I think you'll agree, a really good question. How will this be since I am a virgin? She obviously understood Gabriel to be saying that her child would be conceived before she got married. At the time, she was engaged to Joseph. Everybody knows that. And you may also know something of the cultural context. In those days, the betrothal, what we would call the engagement, was formalized in a public ceremony and generally lasted for about a year, during which time the, the, the intended bride was sometimes referred to as the man's wife. This was the nomenclature of the day. But the couple did not live together. They certainly did not have sexual relations. For in those days, this is what the commentators tell us, an engagement was regarded as a definite promise of mutual fidelity and its violation was looked upon as adultery. Of course, a godly young woman like Mary was saving sexual intimacy for marriage. But this raised an obvious question. How could she conceive and bear a son if she had never been with a man? She, she knew enough about the reproductive process to know this was utterly impossible. She, she had to ask the question, how will this be since I am a virgin? It was a good, honest question. Gabriel gave her a simple answer, simple in the words, if not in the meaning. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the Son of God. For nothing will be impossible with God. This is the miracle of the incarnation that Christians have always confessed. It's what we say in the Nicene Creed, for example. God the Son was incarnated by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. 
No work of the Spirit is more miraculous than what he did in Mary's womb, enabling a virgin to conceive and give birth. It's one of the essential facts and great mysteries of the gospel. According to Luke, Mary gave birth to a son before she had intercourse. Do you believe this or not? If we say that Jesus was not born of a virgin, then either I think we have to believe that Mary was sexually immoral or else that Luke was the writer of amazingly popular fiction. But either way, we defame the character of godly people and contradict the plain teaching of Scripture. We also deny the deity of, deity of Jesus Christ because his conception by the Spirit is part of what constitutes him as the Holy Son of God. This virgin birth preserves both the humanity and the deity of Jesus Christ, one person, one person, two natures, a divine nature and a human nature, sinless perfection. And of course, fallen humanity could not produce its own savior. It, the savior had to come from somewhere outside by way of divine intervention. And so it was that God sent his son into the world by his spirit, the holy son of God. Now, reason from that Think of the logical and even the theological possibilities as they apply to your own experience. For you as students, for you as graduates, with everything that lies before you, if it is true that God could perform the miracle of the virgin birth, he is quite handle, capable of handling the difficulties of your daily life. This is part of the practical point that Luke wants to draw from the virgin birth. Nothing is impossible with God. That's what Gabriel wants you to know. Not just that the virgin birth is not impossible, but nothing is impossible with God. It's a verse to live by. And particularly for all of the things in your life that seem to be impossible. Does it seem impossible for your great sin to be forgiven and then forgiven again? Impossible for your family to be restored after all the heartbreak. Impossible for your financial or other practical needs to be met. You, you just really don't see how it can happen. Does it seem impossible that you will ever be delivered from some suffering that has come into your life? The Bible says nothing is impossible with God. He's, he's the God of the virgin birth, so there's no sin he cannot forgive, no relationship he cannot reconcile, no problem he cannot solve, no need he cannot meet, no grief that he cannot comfort, no life that he cannot rescue. This God of the virgin birth, he makes all things possible. And so in having a Martin Luther Christmas, have faith in the God of the virgin womb and you will find courage to face anything and everything that life sends your way. Do you believe this? Is it something you can live by? Mary certainly did believe it. And so her conversation with the angel ends with a great confession of faith. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. See, Mary took God at his word, which I think is also characteristic of the best Christ-centered liberal arts students. They ask the questions, but they also believe the God who has given the word. She didn't raise further objections. She didn't ask any more questions. She didn't ask the angel to help her resolve the mystery before she would step out in faith. She didn't hold out for an easier calling. She didn't ask God to explain exactly what would happen tomorrow if she said yes to his will today. All she needed to know was what God wanted her to do. And once she knew that, that was enough for her. She was ready to do it. And understand what that meant for Mary. It meant in that moment being willing to give up her relationship with Joseph. It meant losing her reputation in town. It meant all the physical pains that went with pregnancy and childbirth. It meant all kinds of other hardships that Mary in that moment could never have predicted. A journey to Bethlehem, an exile in Egypt, the hatred of Herod. <coughs> And of course, the greatest suffering of all when Mary had to endure the arrest, the crucifixion, the bloody burial of her beloved son. That's what it meant 
whether she knew it or not, when she submitted to God's will for her life. It was really a lifetime of many sufferings for the greater glory of God. How did she do it? How was she able to offer such costly service? And the answer is by faith. That's, that's why Luther loved the story, not only of Jesus, but also of Mary and her faith relationship with Jesus. She was trusting God for all of it, for Joseph, for Nazareth, for Bethlehem, for Calvary. She believed in the God of the impossible and followed him with trusting obedience. And I think this is simply what it means to be a Christian. Indeed, I think in a way we could think of Mary as the first Christian, the first one who simply received the saving gift of Jesus Christ and said, behold, I am your servant, Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. It means trusting God for your relationships, trusting God for your academic pursuits, trusting God for your future, trusting God with your troubles, whatever impossible things you have to face. My prayer for you is that by the grace of God, and by the work of his spirit, you will be able to say what Mary said, Lord, Jesus, I'm your servant. Let it be for me according to your will. And I pray that in doing so, you will be able to experience a Martin Luther Christmas full of all the sweetness and consolation and hope and joy of Jesus Christ.